Yes, we have to talk about another bundler in JavaScript. I know after bun, after roll up, roll down, all of the chaos that's been going on with the turbo pack stuff, you might be tired of bundlers. But this one's really exciting. It's doing things fundamentally different. It's not just seeing how fast it can bundle, it's seeing how efficient it can bundle. How good can these bundlers get at actually generating the perfect output for our websites? Not just once, but as they change over time. Kudos, the first ever reverse bundler. I'm excited to see what they mean by that. Obviously, we'll be looking through their announcement post, taking a look at the GitHub, and maybe even playing with it at the end. So without further ado, let's take a look at Kudo, a reverse JS bundler. Kudo's a novel approach to shipping code on the web. It lets you reuse code a client already has for shipping updates. Very exciting. All the game devs in the world are thinking, wait, you guys don't do that? You ship all of your code on every update? Like Call of Duty? Yeah. Let's see what it looks like to not. He already gave a talk on this, so if you want to check that out, I'll be sure to link it in the description, but we're going to be focused on the post. For a real-world site with around 3 megabytes of JavaScript, updating the React dependency resulted in a 71% smaller download, as well as a 28% faster start time on a 5-year-old phone that Pixel 3, versus a single bundle, or any case where all of the code is invalidated, which is very, very common. A little bit of a history lesson, when we first set up ESM and this idea of individual modules in the browser, things were interesting. The dream was that if every website uses the same version of React and we all import them from the same URL, like unpackage.js or whatever, slash React version 18, if you've already been to a website with React 18 and it downloaded that bundle, ideally that'll be cached on your device. And now when you go to other web pages, it won't have to re-download that code. This sounded incredible and was the dream we were all optimizing towards. What we didn't realize was the fact that if you have two websites that are sharing the same JavaScript, you can now tell that that user's been to another website. If there's only two websites in the world that have this one JS file in it, and it loads really fast on one of them because it came from the cache, you now know as the developer that that user's been to the other site before. It makes cross-site user identification trivial to the point where you can't really implement this type of caching without enabling some level of multi-site user tracking. Because of that, we never got to the point where we could actually share bundles across websites, where one page and another page could share the same React bundle in your browser's cache. Because if the caches weren't specific to the web pages you were on, they could be used to identify who you are, which is terrifying. And as a result, the browser no longer lets you share JavaScript bundles between different sites. Because of that, we largely gave up on this idea of hot swapping modules in websites because we could no longer share them between sites. The only benefit would be in cases like this, where you update the bundle on your current site, which ideally happens rarely enough that you could just eat the bundle. Kudo seems to be one of the first bundlers to really acknowledge this idea of like ESM sets of bundles for all the different things that your site depends on. So it can swap out individual bundles without swapping out everything else. Very interesting. Note that Kudo works really well on the final ESM bundles of real sites or apps, but probably not libraries themselves, even though Kudo's output will still be valid. Kudo also works as a predictable chunk generator for large bundles. Very interesting. If this is interesting to you, do you have too much JS? Then do the thing and do a Kudo on your code. Very interesting. Previously, this link to their website. Now their website just goes straight to GitHub, which we'll check out in a bit, because I do actually want to try running this on some of our services. I'm very curious. So how does it work? Instead of focusing on minifying outputs or anything item potent, Kudo takes a different route. On the first build, Kudo splits source JS into a main part and a normally larger corpus of code, which has no side effects. This corpus can be cached forever and a hash timestamp is included in its output name. Now on every build going forward is where things start to get really interesting. Kudo still splits out the source JS, but it also identifies code from any existing corpus that can be used to satisfy the source JS. Each corpus will either stay the same or shrink as functions, statements, etc. start to change. And any code that cannot be satisfied is put in a brand new corpus, which can also be cached forever. This is a bit complicated, so let's see the GIF. So we have the main bundle that has this constructor, it has the setup, and all these things. So those become part of the main no side effect code here. And then the main JS code that gets split out is what actually runs these functionalities. So the custom elements that define gets called is coming from those split parts. So let's watch the video again so we can see how it actually splits. So we have the KT ABC with no side effects and we have this main code that actually runs. And then we make some update. Let's say we change um, the root and HTML to goodbye. Now it's going to yank this chunk out of the original corpus, the ABC, make a new one that has just this new thing that changed. And then main.js can still reference everything as expected. Very interesting. Also potentially very fragile. People are already commenting in chat. All fair points around. 
but I'm very curious what this looks like. After each build, you're likely to generate another corpus with the changed code. So it'll eventually be an issue with fragmentation, but we'll get to that in a bit. So why does this work? Each corpus, once fetched by a client, can be cached forever. However, on every build, that corpus may shrink in size. New clients will get the smaller version. Kudos corpuses have a hash timestamp and you do have to set up your web server to send the right headers here. Interesting. The idea of a bundler that cares as much about your web servers and the headers it's sending is very interesting. But this breaks all we know about caching responses on the web of change in mutable file. Very fair. Part of this is that the ABC file at the top here is getting changed even though it's been cached. So how does that work? The result is that older clients will have bigger files and newer clients will have smaller ones, even for the same file names. But that bigger file simply has the now deprecated code. Kuda's primary thesis is that disk IO to load a slightly bigger file than you need is much faster than compiling a new. Interesting. I like that they're calling this out as like a primary thesis. This is the classic like use storage instead of compute or use memory instead of compute type argument where they're saying having more stuff in your disk and having to load more stuff into your browser is better than having to go through the network to get it and then recompile it on your machine from scratch. Very fair. And they're also calling out that like this old ABC bundle, it actually still has the setup.code in it. It's just been replaced with the new bundle. It shows it is gone here, but it is technically still within that bundle. Note that at least V8 based browsers cache the bytecode of the source, which provides the speed benefit. If you were compiling a new every time, CUDA wouldn't help. Very interesting point as well. If you had to run the JS through the bytecode compiler in the first place, then storing the old files wouldn't matter. But because they have the exact same file, they can make that step go much faster. Aside from the remarkably bonkers ways that this leverages your browser, Kudo also basically performs code splitting in a completely predictable, useful, and automated fashion. Other bundlers either require you to not code split an output at all, explicitly mark dependencies to be put in their own bundles, or even put code in bundles on effectively random boundaries, just trying to restrict the size of each chunk. Uh, you've been there, done that, not fun. I like that we can do these things at a rote level instead, but it still sucks. But how does this actually work? I love the no really, how does it work? Because there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical here. I see people in chat already saying things like, I don't trust them to correctly identify no side effects. Still feels like it implodes if a browser misbehaves with caching. I wonder if this generates 100 files after sometimes. Like a lot of reasonable skepticisms here that I'm not trying to downplay. Cool, so how does this work? The above explanation was fairly high level. At a lower level, Kudo looks for code with no side effects to include in its corpuses, and it uses circular dependencies to ensure they're safe to call. Intentional using circular depths to make sure things are safe is an interesting choice. Let's see how that works. No side effects. Turns out defining a function has no side effects. No, really. The definition of a function does nothing except create a variable. Fair. Since foo isn't actually called, and we can declare it in a module scope, nothing happens. Until we run foo, it might as well be this. Yeah. Kudo takes this theory to the extreme, putting classes in the same form, and even arbitrary statements. We hand wave can hoist statements to be within a function. I like the hand wave here, making it clear that although we can hoist statements to be within a function, it's a vague, vague way of describing this, and I'm curious to see where it starts to break down. Circular dependencies, everyone's favorite. Each corpus contains siloed functions, which reference back to the main file in order to work out their dependencies. A good way to see this is to check out Kudo itself and run its release.sh script, which builds Kudo itself this way. For a trivial site that appends a custom element to your page, where the custom element has changed and been rebuilt, this might look like the following. We have the ABC, the DEF, we have the call to one, and then we export to. Very interesting. But then we have the main ABC codes. This is that first bundle, the one that's being imported here, which imports two from main. This is the circular depths that it's talking about where the main JS imports from ABC and then ABC imports two from main. Export var underscore one, function setup site, elements a new instance of two, and then we append that element to the page. And two is the actual class coming from kdef. Interesting, very interesting. Yeah, the, the one underscore bit here is also confusing because it's not calling this. One underscore isn't underscore one. I don't know if that's a typo or if that's something different. I'm leaning towards it being a typo because this is exporting underscore one as a function setup site. So this almost certainly is just a typo there. Regardless, very interesting. Very interesting. This all looks awkward and it is, but the output isn't really meant for human consumption, but we benefit from ESMs seen as a bug feature of circular dependencies. Very interesting. Because yeah, circular depths feel like a bug and quite a hack. 
Also, a great point from Bot Cooper. Imagine the stack traces in Sentry. I'd prefer not to. That sounds terrifying. <laughs> so should we use this? Maybe. Kudos new. And while the science says it works, it's a bit weird. As I mentioned before, it works really well on single bundle output sites that have large JS bundles, like a megabyte or larger, that are made up of lots of top-level ESM code, like functions and classes. I know a certain framework that largely meets this requirement. But in order to do this, you'll need to use a regular bundler first. It's also very interesting. This is the only bundler I know of that requires another bundler, other than Vite. Okay, I guess a few actually do. But most of them prescribe the bundler you use. The fact that they require you to bundle normal way yourself first and then run Kudo after is fascinating. You also have to keep or have access to your old build artifacts. Kudo doesn't know what you already shipped by magic. Another important point, because when it's making these diffs to make these new bundles, it needs to know what the old bundle was in order to do that correctly. So you have to store that as state somewhere that it has to reference during the compilation. Right now, if you make a new build on something like Vercel, or even just using it in GitHub with GitHub Actions, it has no idea what the last build looked like. So if it's trying to compare the old build and the new build, nope, doesn't do that. Very interesting. Ooh, I like that framing a lot. Kudo's more of a post-processor of a bundler. It's a very good way of framing this. And the third point here that you have to deal with is that you have to trade off a slightly larger first load for a better update experience. Also a very good point. I find that things like Lighthouse care way too much about calculating the performance when you first load a page and not on future navigations, not on going back to the site in the future, especially after something's updated. There's so many little things that matter with performance that aren't just how long it takes to load the first time that we don't measure for, which is funny because a lot of the things Kudo is doing here are not going to come up in like a Lighthouse check. They're gonna come up in very specific, I shouldn't say very specific, they're gonna come up in much more realistic places. Like when you go to a website for the 800th time and a third of the site has changed. That's what's interesting here. It's not gonna benchmark in the ways we would expect to see to get a bunch of hype around it, but it is going to change actual performance characteristics users experience, which means that I'm excited to see where these ideas go. Even if I don't end up using Kudo, hopefully some of these ideas can be stolen by other frameworks, other bundlers, other solutions, so we can make better updates to our sites over time. The other issue with this is that more and more browsers are moving to a world where cache is regularly evicted. If your visitors don't have your site cached, then Kudo is pointless. Every load is slightly more expensive for an update that never happens. Your mileage may vary. That's actually a fun thing, and I've seen this way too many times with devs, where some dev will turn on disable caching when they're testing, and then leave it on, and then complain about every website feeling slow. Well, yeah, no shit. Every time you click a button, it has to load all of the JavaScript, all of the HTML, all of the pictures, all of the everything, because you turned off caching. And if you're just like living in incognito or using one of those crappy Chrome extensions for privacy that automatically does this shit for you, stop. It's useless and just makes your experience way worse. People are suggesting that that only applies when DevTools is open. I'm not sure that's the case. I am pretty sure that there's at the very least a way in Chrome to permanently disable caching. I've seen two separate users of things I built that had caching fully disabled in Chrome and had to make changes to fix it. Hover over the checkbox. Am I getting corrected live? Network. Disable, yeah, while DevTools is open. Does throttling stay disabled? Because I've definitely, so I just put this on slow 3G. Okay, yeah, that only is working when that's open. That's good at least. So yeah, as long as you don't have this open, shouldn't affect things. But make sure you have caching enabled in case you're the type person who might have disabled that via a Chrome flag. Caching makes the web much better. Anyways, let's see what more they have to say here. Regardless, the tool emits a few statistics, including how much overhead the initial load costs you and what percentage of code is able to be identified as having no side effects and put into a corpus. And to be clear, running Kudo on tiny code bases has no benefit. The cost of parsing a few kilobytes of JS is trivial, even for potato phones. I love when performance people call these things out, where they're like, yes, we're solving real performance issues, but you're not going to see these issues on small enough projects. I find most performance people get really caught up on like, percentage differences, even if both numbers are really small, it's annoying. And this is not the case here at all. It's nice to have the author outright saying, hey, if your thing is small, then it already is performant. This is for when things are so big that they can't be performant with the current way of doing things. I wish more people would call things out like this because it makes them much easier to trust. And I very much am trusting this author thus far. So you can experiment and see if it works for you. My view is that Kudo will help for enterprise apps because the JS is bloated and no one really cares. Or things like social media because power users come to the services so often. I really like these two points and I can confirm having worked on both enterprise software and social media platforms. Yeah, 
I still remember every time we would ship an update on Twitch, that time to first byte would go to shit because everybody has to load the new JavaScript bundle, which would be like megabytes in size before they could do anything on the site. So whenever we shipped an update, which we would do every day at around, I think it was like 3 p.m. Pacific time every weekday, performance on the site would get much worse for a little bit as people downloaded the new bundle and then would slowly balance out over time. The idea of having tooling that means they only have to load the things that actually changed is actually really exciting. And for internal enterprise tools, like the system that we built for managing all of the like security and safety stuff within Twitch, like the platform we built for reviewing reports had a ton of random JavaScript for weird compliance stuff and features that our staff wanted and shit. And that bundle got big, even though the vast majority of it never changed. And we were shipping that through continuous deployment. So every time anyone pushed something that went to main, that would get updated and all of the employees would have to reload all of the JavaScript. If they only had to download the little bit that changed, that would be really, really cool. So somebody said, you'd imagine Twitch is less worried about first load. It's not first load. It's every time an update happens, you're a first load again. So every day at 3 p.m. Pacific time in like weekdays, every user becomes a first time user of Twitch because every user has to re-download all of Twitch's JavaScript. If you use something like Kudo, then every time you load Twitch and there's a new bundle, you only have to load the parts that change. You don't have to reload all of the JS on Twitch before you can do anything. That's why this is so cool because for recurring users, you don't have to download so much shit constantly. So let's talk about fragmentation. Interesting. Kudo generates multiple files over time. Right now, it actually only uses the top four by size, previous bundles, although this is configurable by a flag. Interesting that it's only gonna use the four biggest bundles and throw away the rest so quickly. This is not very good. And I've yet to come up with a good alternative metric as to when to clean up versus reuse. Also very fair. Finding these thresholds, certainly finding them in a generic way that you recommend to all is very difficult. So how do we actually decide on the boundary here? Because this is a tough decision to make. Consider this though. If you just don't provide Kudo with historic bundles, it obviously can't use them. So you can decide whether that typo fix generating a 100 byte file is worth it for the next build. Interesting. The idea here is you decide as the developer when you do and don't nuke your existing cache. Hmm. So why is this only 28% faster? Ignoring some of the possible downsides, there's a big question for me at play. My test case above showed 71% reduction in size, but only a 28% increase in speed. That is a pretty terrifying ratio. I am curious what the use is here. I have a suspicion that V8's assembly of a bunch of module code is still quite costly, yet it's great that huge chunks of static code can be outsourced and cached forever. But in the end, your website still needs to assemble it all together. That checks out, but also is a hard thing to, to suspect without really digging in. We'll go with it for now, but check the comments in case somebody's found a better reason for why the performance here is as big of a gap as it is. The author asks for us to try out Kudo and see if it makes a material difference in the way that we bundle and update our code even if it's just in a theoretical test environment. Please feel free to contact him, including filing a GitHub issue, if I can get him some sweet, sweet numbers. I'll open this up to y'all because I don't want to try getting this to run a next. I'm terrified of the thought, genuinely. But if you're building something small with Vite and you want to try this out, I actually think it's a really good thing to play with. It looks really interesting and it's cool to see somebody meaningfully challenging the norm with bundling in JS. I actually think the thanks at the end here is more interesting than usual because it's something that he's been thinking about for years, but it only took a few days to actually build it. And I find this is really common with cool projects like this. I know I and many others have sat here thinking about something we wish existed that didn't and just thought about it for years. And then finally sitting and building it is really cool because that's one of the best ways to share these ideas with the world. And what I'm seeing here is much more interesting than the theory crafting that this would have been if you didn't have something working. I don't know how realistic it is to run this on stuff right now. I've seen a lot of reasonable skepticism in chat. And I personally don't want to try getting this working in a Next code base since Next and ESM aren't really like super close just yet. But I am very curious if any of y'all have a chance to play with this, what the result ends up being. Kudo bundles Acorn to do its parsing. What is Acorn? I've heard of this a few times. 80 million. I've heard about this a decent number of times, hopefully. It's a JS-based JS parser. Oh yeah, that's what this is. Checks out. So definitely check this out if you're interested. I'm very curious if anybody comes up with anything. Let me know in the comments if you actually end up playing with this and end up doing anything cool with it. And until next time, peace nerds.